The goal of this video is to help you understand the basic exam skills required for a bedside ophthalmic exam. We will show you examples of both normal and abnormal physical exam findings. Please pause and play back the video as necessary so that you are able to appreciate any abnormal physical exam findings demonstrated. The eye exam we will cover involves assessment of the following, visual acuity, confrontational fields, intraocular pressure, pupils, eye motility, eyelids and lashes, conjunctiva sclera and cornea, lens, and optic nerve. It's very important to check the vision in all patients with ophthalmic complaints. At the bedside, a NIA card can be used. These can be purchased or downloaded onto your smartphone. Check vision one eye at a time. The standard distance for near vision is 14 inches. Before you check the vision, remember to ask about use of corrective lenses or glasses. Have the patient put them on before checking their vision. And remember, if a patient does not wear corrective lenses, when they are above the age of 40, they may have trouble reading at near because of a natural decline in accommodative ability of the eye. This is also known as presbyopia. If this is the case, you'll notice that the patient will want to hold the reading material farther away from them. After testing visual acuity, we will check confrontational fields. To perform confrontational field testing, begin by sitting at eye level with a patient at approximately arm's length. Have them focus on your eyes or nose. We test one eye at a time. You can close your eye that is not in line with the eye you are testing so that you can appreciate what the patient is seeing. Test one quadrant at a time by holding up a different number of fingers each time. If you identify that a patient cannot see your fingers in the right and left temporal fields, this is known as bitemporal hemianopsia and should raise immediate suspicion that a lesion is compressing the optic chiasm. The most common cause of bitemporal hemianopsia is a pituitary tumor. Strokes can also present with visual field abnormalities. A monocular visual field deficit accompanied by symptoms of flashes, floaters, or a curtain coming across the vision, may herald a retinal detachment. Next, we will assess intraocular pressure. Ophthalmologists have several devices available to accurately measure intraocular pressure, but in the office setting, finger palpation can be used to estimate a patient's intraocular pressure. To do this, have the patient close their eyes and look down toward their toes. Use both index fingers to gently palpate the globe one side at a time. Compare the eyes. To get an idea of what a normal intraocular pressure is, you may perform this technique on your own eyes. Beware that if you suspect that a patient has a ruptured globe, do not attempt to assess intraocular pressure as this may cause further damage to the eye. The pupil exam is very important. We can use a pen light or flashlight to examine the pupil. We are interested in assessing whether pupils are round, regular, symmetric, and if they constrict to light. Start by standing about one to two feet from the patient and have the patient focus in the distance to prevent meiosis. Next, shine the light on one pupil at a time. As you shine the light on the pupil, observe how it constricts. You should also observe the contralateral pupil while shining the light on one pupil. Here, you are looking for a consensual response. This means that light shown in one pupil elicits constriction in the contralateral eye. You can see in this video that the pupils constrict consensually. We have examples of individuals with different iris colors. It is helpful to dim the lights, especially for patients with meiotic pupils and dark iris colors. You can also ask the patient to tilt their chin up slightly to give you better visualization. The next part of this test is a swinging flashlight test. This helps you identify the presence of a relative afferent pupillary defect, or an APD. Let's start by shining the light into the right pupil. Observe how it constricts. Maintain focus on the right pupil and move the light to the left pupil. Then bring back the light source to the right pupil. The pupil should maintain its constriction. If the pupil starts to dilate, there is an APD. This can be caused by conditions such as optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve, or asymmetric optic nerve damage. In any patient that presents with decreased vision and pain with eye movement, check for an APD. In this video, notice how the pupil first constricts and then starts to dilate. This is known as hippus, and it is not pathologic. The important finding is that the pupil constricts first when exposed to light.
After checking the pupils, we will test eye motility. Ask the patient to follow your fingers without moving their head. You are looking to make sure that the eyes move well in all directions of gaze. Patients may report a history of ocular misalignment since childhood, known as strabismus. They may also report intermittent drifting of their eyes, especially when they're tired or ill. These chronic, non-life-threatening disorders of ocular motility are called phorias when intermittent and tropias when present all the time. If someone presents with acute double vision or diplopia, first assess whether it is present with only one eye open or with both eyes open. If it is present with one eye open, this decreases your concern for a vision or life-threatening condition. If double vision is present when both eyes are open, it is concerning for cranial nerve palsy. You can also use a pen light to check for ocular alignment. Look for a symmetric corneal light reflex. This is known as a Hirschberg test. A normal corneal light reflex appears slightly medial to the center of the pupil in both eyes. Misalignment will cause a displaced corneal light reflex in the affected eye. Patients with cardiovascular risk factors may develop a fourth or sixth nerve palsy. For a sixth nerve palsy, the corneal light reflex is displaced temporally, while in a fourth nerve palsy, it is displaced inferiorly because of the resultant hypertropia. Patients with a fourth nerve palsy will also have a head tilt in the opposite direction of the affected side. In this video, we see a patient with a right third nerve palsy and is unable to adduct his right eye. The fixed dilated pupil is indicative of a compressive third nerve palsy. It is recommended that neuroimaging is obtained for patients presenting with acute cranial nerve palsies. The lids and lashes should be smooth, well positioned, and symmetric. Any asymmetric alignment of the eyelid needs to be investigated and may require a referral to an ophthalmologist. These are pictures of some common eyelid conditions that you may encounter in your clinical setting. Third and seventh nerve palsies can cause ptosis and can have life-threatening etiologies. The conjunctiva is a thin sheet of mucosa that covers the white of the eye, or the sclera. A pen light or direct ophthalmoscope can be helpful for the bedside examination of the conjunctiva, sclera, and cornea. The conjunctiva can become red when there is dryness, infection, trauma, or inflammation. When assessing any patient with a red eye, it is important to identify vision-threatening causes. A painful red eye is almost always an ophthalmic emergency. A history that includes trauma, contact lens wear, and light sensitivity is always concerning. In these scenarios, a ruptured globe, corneal ulcer, and iritis should be ruled out respectively. If a patient reports a history that suggests a foreign body on the ocular surface, eyelid eversion can be performed to look for it. These are some pictures of some conditions that you may encounter in your clinical setting. A direct ophthalmoscope is very helpful in identifying lens opacities. Hold it approximately 1 to 2 feet away from the patient and look at the red reflex through the pupil. Dulled or asymmetric red reflexes can be caused by the presence of a cataract. Some cataracts look milky white, others look brownish, and others may look like a plaque. Finally, we will assess the optic nerve macula and retinal vessels. Sit at eye level with the patient. To help us locate the optic nerve quickly, have the patient look slightly nasally with the eye you're trying to examine. Alternatively, you can examine their eye coming in at about a 45 degree angle. When you're examining the right eye, use your right hand to hold the direct ophthalmoscope. Hold the direct ophthalmoscope with your index finger on the dial. Make sure it is set to 10, as this allows you to focus on the anterior structures of the eye, such as the cornea. Place your left hand on the patient's forehead. Once you get close to the eye, dial down until retinal structures or the optic nerve are in focus. If you are in focus on blood vessels, remember that the V created by bifurcating blood vessels points in the direction of the optic nerve. Due to magnification of the direct ophthalmoscope, the optic nerve fills the view of an undilated pupil. When we examine the optic nerve, we look at the cup, color, and contour. A large cup signifies possible glaucomatous changes. 
A pale optic nerve is caused by optic neuropathy from previous trauma, inflammation, or a chronic compressive lesion. In cases of elevated intracranial pressure, inflammatory or compressive lesions, the contour of the optic nerve can be affected. In these scenarios, the borders can be elevated with hemorrhages and obscuration of the blood vessels. The macula should be flat and without any pigmentary changes or deposits. The most common cause of macular disease in people over the age of 65 years is age-related macular degeneration. Normal retinal vessels are in an arterial to venous ratio of 2 to 3. Observe the shape, contour, color, and caliber of the vessels. Abnormalities such as tortuous vessels, narrowing or dilation of the vessels, or arterial nicking may suggest changes due to chronic diseases including hypertension, diabetes, and obstructive sleep apnea.